Okay, welcome everyone to Cafe Compassion. Thank you for having me here to uh, moderate this uh, discussion. I think it's going to be a very interesting one. Uh, before I get on to today's topic, I I quickly like to explain how today uh, is going, how we're going to go about this today, and how this will be conducted. Um, we will begin with uh, Nandita Subarao, who I will introduce shortly, and Abhi Van and Dr. Abhi Vanak. After which, after they both the experts have presented their side, uh, the groups that we have here, which is for feeding animals, potentially against feeding animals, and the ones who are neutral about this, will have uh, their group discussions. Before that, you have a chance to switch your position after hearing the experts speak. So once you have your discussion, uh, you need to appoint a speaker from your group who will then come uh, forward to present their side in about two and a half minutes, like a, a summary of your discussion after you've heard the speakers. And after which we will have closing remarks by the experts and myself who will summarize the entire discussion. All right, so uh, let me introduce the experts to you today. So we have Nandita Subarao, who is speaking, who is our expert today speaking for feeding animals. She is a civic welfareist. Among, uh, apart from her interest in reducing wastage and encouraging recycling, her focus is on ensuring peaceful coexistence between human beings and street dogs. In order to achieve this, for the last six years, she has been a strong advocate for neutering and vaccination of street dogs, thus controlling their population and making them safer for the community. She is also a parent to two street dogs that she adopted and uh, who she has given a forever home to. Nandita holds a bachelor's degree in architecture and has also worked in the fields of software, banking and marketing. She is currently a ward committee member in the BBMP Ward 19. The other speaker today is Dr. Abhi Vanak, who a lot of people here are familiar with. He is a senior fellow at ATRI. His broad interests are in animal movement ecology, disease ecology, one health, savannah ecosystems, invasive species, both plants and animals, and wildlife and human dominated systems. Much of his recent work focuses on the outcome of interactions between the species at the interface of humans, domestic animals, and wildlife in semi-arid savannas and agroecosystems. So, to begin today uh, and set the context, I'd like to invite both the ex both our speakers on stage. So, Article 51G in the Constitution of India outlines that it shall be the duty of every citizen to protect and improve the natural environment, including forests, lakes, rivers, wildlife, and to have compassion for all living creatures. Now, this fundamental duty, or a part of it, is often quoted by several individuals who feed animals, including homeless and abandoned cows, cats, dogs on our streets. Um, it could be pigeons, wild birds like parakeets, crows to monkeys and deer. Now, feeding animals can be sporadic sometimes in the case of tourists or passerbys who, um, you know, who are feeding a seemingly hungry animal or one that appears to be requesting for food or insists on being fed, example monkeys in tourist spots. Sometimes people make it a regular activity to feed animals daily in the case of cows, dogs, cats or pigeons. Now this act of feeding, domestic or wild, does it benefit them or does it hurt them? Does it foster conflict or coexistence? What impact does the act of animal feeding by humans have on the animals? Is animal feeding an act of compassion or is it misguided compassion? So today uh, we're, go we're going to begin with uh, Nandita Subarao, who, um, who, um, uh, who will now speak 
uh, for feeding animals. Am I audible? Okay, is this okay for your recording? So can you just check? Uh, okay, is the recording it's okay? Okay. If my seven minutes starts now? <laughs> okay, thanks. I stand up, I think it's easier for me <laughs> somehow. Okay, I'm not even going to get into this constitutional legal part of it. I'm going to talk about it only from a very practical perspective. No religious, no compassionate, no nothing. Um, and I'll focus first on dogs. If we have time, I'll go on to pigeons and cows. I have an opinion on that as well, but let's see, depending on the time. But dogs is always the burning issue for everybody, so I'll focus on the dog part. So I think there is somewhere in the spec in the for the debate it said the cost of dog food, people spend a lot of money on this. Yeah, it's true, some people do spend, but for a lot of people in India, feeding dogs is an easy way to get, get rid of leftover food. You'll see a lot of people, a little extra rice, a little chapati, everything. They don't, may not even need to feed, but they actually just put it out there, right? And a lot of people don't have refrigeration facilities. And if we think of a lot of the dog food commercial that's made or even what you buy at the store, the fresh one, processed and fresh dog food is made up of a lot of meat waste, liver, wings, and uh, beaks, and gizzard, and that stuff, which the human beings don't consume. So does it really add to extra rearing, extra chickens, extra, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I'm not sure it does. Uh, so a lot of this reduces the waste that is processed by the municipality for BBMP, for example. They would have a lot more waste material to take away if it was not fed to some other animal to consume. So anyway, let's take a step back. Why do we have so many dogs, especially in Bangalore? Right? Bangalore is really, really bad. So this is, I think, the price that we're paying for prosperity. Uh, 20 years ago, we didn't have this. Today we have a lot more affordability, a lot more ready-to-eat food, takeaway food, and a lot of wastage. And people don't dispose of it responsibly, and the garbage piles attract cockroaches and rats and cats and dogs. You look around you everywhere, I've seen this even in posh areas. You'll see garbage thrown, people throw it from fancy cars, and at three corners in vacant plots, quietly they go do it at night, or sometimes they don't openly do it in front of you, they don't care. And uh, so now the burning question of this video, I think, is if the dogs are already foraging at the garbage piles, why are we even feeding them? Why should we feed them? So I think the reason we should feed them is if the, what they get at the garbage pile, there is no predictability. The dog doesn't know whether it's going to get food today or not at the garbage dump. There's really no predictability. And if it doesn't, if it goes hungry, then it goes foraging into some other dog's territory. They get into gang wars over there. And then they may attack somebody who's passing by or they also ruin our sleep. I think all of us have been through that. So that's one thing for feeding them. The other, I would say, one other, three others, despite all the nuisance, yes, they bark, they bite, they tear up trash. I still think they have three major roles to play in society. One is the scavenging, as I said before, you know, it reduces the amount of garbage that goes to landfill or wherever for processing. The other, the second one is rodent control. They are very, very active at hunting mice at night, right, rats and mice at night. And uh, I think we all know about the Surat plague and what happened over there because they removed the entire uh, dog population. And also when it comes to uh, our garbage processing, a lot of us consume meat. The bones, if you were to bury them, it would take very long to decompose. It takes up space. I mean, we eat large animals, right? Cows, pigs, uh, goats, everything. And if you incinerate it, it needs energy. But if you give it to a dog, it will turn into poop overnight, and it will turn into manure in three months. Just don't use it for no. Don't use it for don't use it for palak and all. You can use it for foliage plants. <laughs> but uh, the third reason, security. And I don't even know how many examples to give here. I'll give you a few. So, one of one of my the guys near my place, after arguments with all his neighbors, they started feeding them four streets away. A few days later, they had two thefts and one burglary. Then they all said, hey, listen, let's bring them all back here and 
how they said listen it's our security at the end of the day we are bothered we want our street to be safe and now they all i uh, embrace that i myself one night when i was walking some drunkard came and came near me and two packs of dogs were having a food fight immediately the guy bolted and i was really really and on other occasion my own street dog today my pet he alerted the hoysala van to two drug dealers who were hiding behind my car i had no clue they they saw him parking there so anyway now the, i think the biggest reason people hate dogs and they're actually scared of dogs i think the number one thing is the fear of rabies most people think every dog carries rabies and is going to spread rabies i think that's the major fear and they think it's like a dog or snake bite because dog bites you oh my god you've got to rush in 2 hours 3 hours otherwise you're finished you're going to die right so actually the truth is most dogs are not rabid and if you wash your wound well and you take your shots even 12 hours later you're going to be fine uh, it's 100% preventable unlike a snake bite where you know by the way bangalore's been on a very active anti rabies vaccination drive for street dogs and doing about 1 lakh dogs per year and there's been no human rabies death in bangalore since march 2020 in fact where we are seeing the right here in this part of the city not even one dog rabies death that has been reported forget human so come back to the point of the debate is it practical to ban feeding can you actually ban it so if you don't feed them what happens they're going to get food fights they're going to get aggressive and all that uh, and let's assume you still say don't feed them will they go away No, I don't think so because people will still keep their trash out at night so that it doesn't stick up. How? If you put it in a nice heavy duty bin, somebody will steal your bin itself. It happened to me. I've lost three dustbins like this. So then you'll start needing cameras everywhere, and how many cameras are you going to put everywhere? And then how do you mandate? How do you enforce that somebody is not putting a proper price at, uh, out at night? How? How you can't even you're not even able to control rubbish. So how are we going to do this? So now the other thing is, can we send them to a shelter? there are huge practical and economic challenges i'm going to share a link to a, a document that i put out and you can go through that i've actually done the costing there because i work closely with bbmp so i know the costs as well so what can we do i think most important we need to work on population control i feed them in order to befriend them so that i can catch them for sterilizing and vaccinating them and i've actually managed to control them at a decent level you know in all the neighborhoods where i've lived so far so but only thing is they need our help they need people like us all of us citizens to help even to catch osama bin laden the americans needed the locals help you know they needed guidance from them tips from them on where to find a dog with ears not notched uh, about that please please think of getting them sterilized i'm just going to share a link with you the change i think begins with all of us uh, here is the link it's tiny.cc/ Cafe. So tiny.cc, tiny.cc slash b a n a k c a f e. So you're most welcome to go. What the best to go through it. I've given you all the links, new information you can use, everything. Okay. And if you want to, um, my name, my my number, email ID, let me feel free to reach out if you have questions. If you want help with new training in the city and all that, just let me know. Thanks. Thank you, Abhi. It's your turn now. Wow! Thanks. Uh, <laughs> also, thanks for immortalizing me. This is the tiny you are. <laughs> may May it live forever. Um, so I um, I'm not going to respond to anything that you said just now because that's not the format. I will first uh, start with what I want to speak about more generally, and I will uh, I'll take the general view first. And um, you know, so talk about why we do. Why we feed animals and how we feed. So I also want to quickly point out that um, I don't think we should call this anti-feeding. I'm not anti-feeding at all. In fact, we have a duty and a, re a responsibility to feed animals. But I'll talk about which kind of animals we should be feeding. Yes. Um, so, what kinds of feeding? We do directed feeding. Okay. If there are animals that are in our direct care, which is our then our Ability to make sure they're well fed, they're healthy. Um, it's there in the charters. It's there in the laws. The PCA Act. You know, we are one of the first countries in the world. We were back in 1962 to enact the uh, Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. Um, so it, it's against animal cruelty laws to keep an animal that you, that is directly under your care. Uh, 
for the directed food. Then there's undirected food. There's a whole biome out there of things that feed on you or feed because of you. Okay, they could be parasites, they could be insects, they could be a whole host of other stuff, including the waste that we generate. Okay, so that's undirected food. And we are we have a large footprint globally and there's a lot of things that depend on what we put out for their survival. Many of these things we know as common sense. So a lot of the birds and the animals you see in cities and other places. If you um, but there's there's a whole whole bunch of, of animals out there that that are uh, that you know, we feed without intention. And then, and this is the contentious part because this is traffic conservation. There's a misdirected food, which is what we are going to talk about a little bit today. And uh, I'm going to divide misdirected food into three C's. Um, the number you know, the and one C is communion. So we do it for religious reasons because we believe that feeding animals or feeding the sick or taking care of the sick or feeding the poor gives us good time. And it's there across religion. Because it's um, it's it's a you know it's a very it's a, it, it, it makes us feel very good about ourselves and uh, it, it's a it's an act of piety, an act of charity, and so we feed animals for religious reasons. We feed out of compassion because we feel that if there's an, if there's an animal that's hungry or that's looking at us, um, you know, with those, especially dogs, you know, they've evolved. Those arched eyebrow, eyebrows, the puppy dog look has actually been, has actually evolved to elicit that reaction from us. Okay, so that we go and, uh, go and, and if you've listened to Rana's talk this morning and India Sinha's talk this morning, monkeys have now evolved a, or have, have now, um, uh, they, they have a, a, a behavior that Vadapur called uh, requesting food, as he said, they're not begging. Uh, so they're requesting food from us, okay? So, um, and a lot of people then throw out food for, for those reasons. And the last one, and this is something that I've been thinking about a lot, and it's out of compulsion. It's almost, it's, um, and this, again, because this is cafe controversial, I'm going to make a very controversial claim. Um, is that uh, many people have heard of animal hoarding. Uh, it's where it's, it's actually known as a, uh, uh, as a mental health problem and where people just become addicted to caring for animals. And to me, I think feeding also becomes that kind of a compulsion. Because, and especially for people who go out and feed tens or hundreds of animals. Um, it's their, their, it becomes a life purpose. Um, and, you know, it, it, it even results in financial problems for them. They go into deep debt uh, and, and a whole host of other issues. I don't have time for that, so I won't do it. But, um, you know, there's a whole host of unintended consequences that flow from, from these kinds of activities. Um, one of those unintended consequences, of course, is that there are a huge number of uh, animals that we... So, the animals that we then choose to feed are not... We are not very general. We are very selective in the animals that we choose to feed. A lot of people feed pigeons. A lot of people feed, people will feed monkeys, cows on the street. Uh, or even, um, you know, in the US, for example, there are bird feeders outside everybody's balcony. In India also, we are encouraged to put out water and and um, uh, so the the types of animals that we feed are there's a very narrow set of them and you know dogs of course we love dogs I love dogs I have, I have two uh, two dogs that that uh, we picked up yeah of course those are the those are the best kind uh, and um, so then, so basically, you know, it, it's not a, it's, it's, we are not, even in the, in the feeding that we do, there's a very directional sort of thing. So then it makes me wonder, who are we feeding for? Are we feeding for the sake of the animals? Or are we feeding for our own sakes, for our own sense of, sort of, you know, it's, it's releases a lot of, you know, it's, it's like, it's, um, it, it makes us feel good feeding an animal, taking care of something. It really does. And, uh, and I think this then gets elevated to certain levels where it kind of becomes out of control sometimes. Um, 
we've done several studies on dogs in Bangalore. This is what I've been doing for a long period of time. I've been studying dogs for more than 15 years. Um, and, you know, we've done lots of studies on, 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 on behavior. Or we've done work on rabies. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to tell you that rabies is a real problem in every city in, in India. And I would not encourage you to say that rabies is not a problem. It is. Uh, no, it's in Bangalore as well. It's, um, I mean, Pune, we've done work where we found hundreds of rabies dogs once we started testing. Bangalore, just because there are no reported rabies dog deaths, doesn't mean, it's simply because people are not testing. Um, and, um, and human deaths are not correlated to uh, canine rabies deaths because humans in cities get good profile vaccines. Okay, thanks. So, at the end of the day, I want to, you know, before I go into in the next session, I'll go into, into uh, talking about responding to some of what Nandita said. But I just want us to leave, leave this out there that when we are feeding animals, let's realize also that we're feeding them with food that was grown for human consumption. And that food was grown at a huge cost to biodiversity. Okay, whether it be grains, now there is thousands of tons of food grains that are being fed to animals every single year. There's an estimate because we don't have those estimates for India, but in the US alone, now that's a huge pet industry there. They're not feeding animals on the streets. So they estimate something like 16 million tons of carbon dye, uh, uh, carbon is, is for, for the pet food industry. Right? So I'll All stop right. there. <laughs> so we're going to... Nandita, uh, would uh, it's your turn again? To, yeah, you can respond. You can make another point based on what he has said. So it's up to us. The change begins with us, and it's easier to control the dog population than to control human behavior. And uh, uh, also, uh, I think to respond to the rabies point, I, what I said was in Bangalore, there hasn't been a rabies uh, case since March 2020. And the dog rabies in this area and the west zone, I have the statistics for all the zones, it is true in other zones that have been. But in this zone, for the last one and a half, two years, there haven't been any dog rabies. They, they actually monitor them. There's a rabies helpline now around the clock in Bangalore for uh, you know, to, to report suspected rabbit dogs. In my link that I have shared, the famous Vanak Cafe link, I have given a link to my blog and I put in a lot of information there. I have also given the information on whom to contact for nutrient vaccination and also about the rabies hotline, the number and everything. I've provided that. I've tried to make it as useful as possible to everybody here because I know there's a lot of information here. And uh, so, uh, so I, I mean, I don't mean to downplay the seriousness of rabies. And about cows and pigeons, honestly, now pigeons, I personally feel uh, I don't think there's any benefit. Like at least with a dog, there is some. It's a companion animal. There's some security, some kind of benefit. Okay, but if, if I would personally not bother feeding a pigeon. But how? There is a. It, I, I'm not like I'm feeding a cow either. I mean, I do personally. I mean, but the point is, the cow owner is a freeloader in our country. In the city, he purposely lets the cow loose so that he can, get, you know, save on uh, food costs. That's the reason he does it. Sends it to the market so that it can eat all the greens over there. And if you don't give it, if you don't feed it, if it doesn't get into the market, the cow owner is going to scream and he's going to say it's very expensive for me and then he'll ask you for money. Or the cost of milk will go up by 10 rupees a liter. At the end of it all, it has some kind of repercussion either on them or on us. So, uh, I mean, it, it's difficult. And again, the thing is practically, how do you stop them from feeding? And also practically, yes, they're helping take away some of your watermelon peel and eating up your banana peels and all that. So they are helping in some way. So. Honestly, like with, with everything else, there are no easy answers. So people who continue to give cows their leftover peel will say, I'm, you know, getting my karma, plus I'm helping you, you know, send less to the landfill. <laughs> and keeping the cow owner happy, otherwise he'll say, I'm not, he'll go, he'll say, I'm going to commit suicide in front of it on some I don't have money to feed my cow and all that stuff. All this will happen. So, anyway, so that's, that's, I think, what it is. And I, as far as, uh, you know, he did, I remember in your YouTube video, you talked about shelters and all that. So I've actually worked out the economics and I'd like you also to go through that because you had said at some point that uh, having these shelters would be cheaper in the long run than doing ABC and ARB. 
So I've actually worked out the costs and I would like you to take a look. And if you can, because with you and I have both adopted, if you can give us suggestions on successful adoption, whatever you can do, that would be great. And you have done wonderful tracking in Pune. If you can help in some way the NGOs or the DNC with some ideas for trapping the dogs that are hard to catch, you know, Lalba, government, all, well, especially US campus, that kind of thing, that will be great. So really appreciate that because you have a lot of influence. Oh, thanks. Okay, back to Abhi. Thanks. So, um, you know, I was, I was quickly jotting down some of the points that you, uh, some of the, uh, of what you said about why we should keep dogs in the street and why. You said one, one gar dogs is garbage disposal. And um, I don't think that we should outsource garbage disposal to dogs. I think it's not fair to them. Um, dogs are companion animals and their welfare is best served in human company fully. Not, not, in, not in half measure. And uh, let's also not forget that the poop uh, that, that dogs, you know, after they've eaten everything, that poop is not collected by anybody. Um, recent studies have shown that dog uh, feces and urine contributes significantly to uh, nitrification of our surface water. So it's, and also it's a health hazard because dogs, most dogs have not been vaccinated uh, they have lots of helmet parasites. It's a health hazard to humans, um, and it can cause significant pollution for, to surface water. So I would not recommend dogs to be um, garbage disposal for us. That's the job. That's why we pay taxes to the government. This is a job of the government. I really don't think we should be outsourcing garbage disposal to street animals. Similarly, we should not be outsourcing security to street animals. Um, we, it's again the job of the government. You know to keep our cities safer. You know, by that extension, countries that don't have street animals should be overflowing with garbage and should have should have rampant uh, problems. But no, I mean, uh, let's also take the counterfactual. Okay, are there cities in India which have fewer dogs but still clean streets? Well, yes, there are. Because there's a good civic mechanism in place. So let's fix those things. I don't think we should uh, have dogs do any of those things. Finally, you also talked about um, rodent control. Now we've done studies on, on dog feeding habits and actually dogs are very poor at rodent control. Uh, less than 2% of their diet consists of rodents. Um, and that Surat example was just completely, um, there was, uh, you know, there's a classic case of causation correlation mismatch. There were no, there's no actual data to show that the removal of dogs led to, in fact, then, it's as if plague hasn't come up ever again in India because we have never killed dogs. No, plague has again and again come up in many other places. Dogs were not removed there. Uh, on the other hand, dogs were removed in many other places and there was no uh, eruption of, of rodents. This example was just touted by Maneka Gandhi saying that, you know, this is it. This is the final proof we, we have that we need dogs in the streets. There's no scientific evidence for that. So I just want to, uh, I just want to put that out there. Um, I also want to say that, um, you know, the, the idea that, uh, that you, oof, there's so many things. <laughs> the, the, the whole concept of territoriality of dogs and, and so on. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll take this up in the last one. All right. We're, uh, you know, we have to be, uh, we have to stick to time. And unfortunately, since we are running a little short of it, um, now's the time where you decide if you want to change positions. Uh, between the groups, if anyone does want to. If not, uh, then you can, you know, uh, get together, appoint a speaker. You have 10 minutes, exactly 10 minutes to have this discussion. And then the speaker who you've uh, chosen from your group will come here and present uh, the group's thoughts and a, a quick summary of it in about two and a half minutes.
May I please have your attention? Hello, everyone, come back, please. That's that's for, that's neutral, and that's anti. <laughs> All right. Rana, hello. So can we have is, this is the neutral no? We'll go with first. Anuja, we'll do for for neutral and then against. So can we have someone from the four feedings group? Who is the speaker for the four feedings group? Neutral and then against. Come. You, you. <laughs> so we have Ram here from the, uh, he's for the representing the group for feeding animals. All right, so this is a group effort. And I'm just summarizing certain points. Uh, and uh, I recognize that we are basically in the minority here. So <laughs> please sh uh, uh, show us some mercy. OK, so the first point is that uh, uh, we have to first define goals for each species. So right now, we are just concerned with dogs because that's the burning issue right now. We wouldn't be here if this whole dog feeding issue hadn't started. Right, so this whole, all the points that I'm going to jot down is for dogs only. We can talk about other species later. Uh, so the gold standard for uh, of, of this issue is to have a control population uh, which is well vaccinated. And uh, well, I don't know how not feeding the dogs is going to control their population. I would like to see, we would like to see studies on that. Not sure if there are any studies on whether not feeding is going to control their population in any, in any meaningful way. Uh, so I think the best way would be to, uh, you know, feed them, befriend them, and then sterilize them. That would be the way to go when you're talking about population control. Uh, the second point is that you talked about uh, directed feeding and that people who are responsible for the animals and dogs belong to the community. So even street dogs are basically owned by the community. So the community are looking after them and they are responsible. It's just not just one person, it's the whole community. So it, 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 uh, it, it, it's, it's their responsibility to look after them. Uh, and then there are studies that, which say that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the best way to address aggression by dogs is to have multiple feeding stations. I think this is an ICER Kolkata study, I'm not really sure maybe they can look at the sources. So to have multiple feeding stations at some prescribed distances would be the best to prevent antagonistic behavior uh, by dogs to humans and vice versa. And then there's also this uh, lot of studies about uh, oxytocin having, having an effect on, uh, you know, uh, you're feeding the dogs, what you talk about, you know, uh, uh, gratification. Uh, so that maybe plays a big role in people, you know, just feeding dogs. And the issue, the mental health issues with animal hoarding and feeding might be really small percentage, uh, you know, when compared to the uh, 
a number of people who benefit mentally from feeding animals and these specific issues can be uh, addressed at a later stage and the last point is that we have a moral obligation with these things because these are commensal animals and they are part of human uh, dominated landscapes so how should this be a different you know why should humans be treated different, differently than thank, thank you ram from the neutral group who do we have as a speaker um <laughs> exactly exactly as we were discussing over tea i am representing a fairly large group of my friends and it's an easy group uh, because we have no opinion <laughs> what that means is that i think it's such a complex situation that we would like to for the lack of a better term go on a case by case basis and when we talk of a case by case basis it would of course not be just dogs then why aren't we talking about mosquitoes or flies or cockroaches so we are talking about moral values are we talking about ethics if that is so then it leaves us in a very murky situation there are also benefits in certain cases that animals have humans have there are also disadvantages that both have in certain situations and therefore we would like to say that and i know this is difficult from a policy point of view if we need to have a policy because how do you account for individual variability in views and experiences uh, when you have a policy but till then we would like to leave it open and decide again to come back to this on a case by case basis how we should respond however we also recognize that if we are let's say in a particular case feeding an animal a dog let's say we have other responsibilities that come along with it and therefore it needs to be a much more comprehensive argument that we need to make if we are going to feed an animal or if we decide not to feed an animal these are obviously complex issues i feed my dog because then the in the street but then i have a neighbor and this is really true who runs after them with a stick every night and so then you wonder whether you should just let the dog not feed the dog and let the dog go somewhere else where hopefully she won't be chased by a neighbor so what is really good for the dog is something that i have no idea about right it it's a very personal decision and i think everyone in the neutral group and i made this point has a different opinion and so i rest my case thank you we have kaushik from the not for feeding animals group uh hi all <laughs> come on <laughs> let's see so first point is as our team said is dog is not responsible for cleaning our city first point this should be our responsibility and municipality look at our own behavior if we are feeding a dog and just letting it be and that's a very irresponsible behavior first off yesterday nitin nitin said uh, when a community feeds a dog then it has sorry about the elephants whose elephant is it i'll say if a dog we are feeding we say we are feeding it it is our responsibility to take care when the dog creates a menace are we taking up that that's a question i would pose second is you say scavenging in all waste disposal that i will not believe much because that's a very limited amount we are looking at second the number of dogs we are feeding in we are putting into population population is a problem everybody knows but who's at the uh, forefront of it kids and elders who are the one being chased attacked many have been mauled a 12 year old kid killed to death in bangalore near yalanka 4 years ago we know that then it's a risk about life and compassion what do you weigh more is the question then i can go up on go on about the risk dogs pose to wildlife if you say compassion about dogs why are we not compassionate about other animals that live alongside us what's about the number of wildlife which moves around us not just dogs cats other things which decimate wildlife all in this urban spaces and peri urban areas hyenas one of our vulnerable species are like battered by the dogs all across then we say we should as an act of kindness we should feed dogs 
what if that we put that food to the shelters where they can be managed kept in a certain space which is much better for the dog to be roaming around in sea street dying a painful death at some point of the life what do you say about that and then zoonosis diseases we know what covid did to all of us many of the places where wildlife moves around zoonosis is a big issue canine distemper virus if people know about it lions are gone already gone and probably because of dogs will go again that's one thing there are a lot more points about cows as well <laughs> <laughs> i think many people will agree on that but i'll rest for now thank you thank you so we'll have uh, we'll invite nandita to speak again after hearing uh, all the summaries from all the three groups thanks so again two and a half minutes right okay hopefully i won't take that long i'll just very quickly answer respond to one of those points about the hyenas i wouldn't talk about hyenas are not in the cities they are only in the forest so i'm not going to talk about that because we are only talking about talking about cities sorry oh, i don't know hyenas in bangalore okay right. okay okay I'm, i must profess <laughs> I'm I must profess I'm a little ignorant rather ignorant about other yes, cities please. so I'm I'm all my experiences from Bangalore so I I can't comment on that um anyway and I don't know how many lions got CD I'm sure they did but I I don't know so I won't answer that now let me just come back to what uh, Dr Vanak said um in fact I I'm totally in agreement with him on many of the points including that it would be great yes we should not be leaving garbage disposal to the dogs and we should I I totally agree with that but the point is the practicality how do you implement it how do you ensure that people fall our people lack discipline that is the biggest problem can you i can't even guarantee my own neighbor goes and throws the trash secretly at night how do i ensure that and they busy people people in big houses i'm telling you so how are you going to ensure that that is the biggest problem so that is why i'm saying considering this okay it at least helps that the dog eats up some of the bones and all that otherwise i wouldn't mind in the us it works well because everybody has a nice tight bin and the system takes it away and uh, nobody goes and steals the bins here people come and steal my bins so everything is a problem <laughs> so then the cost the shelter cost i have worked it out please take a look at the link if you were to put them in a shelter 2 lakh bangalore has like 3 to 4 lakh 5 lakh whatever dogs even if you put 2 lakhs feeding them just for a month would cost you 12 crore rupees i have worked out the cost and that to very bare minimum i'm not even talking about employing labor building the shelter capital expenditure just the cost of the food raw material and on the other hand if you neuter if you neuter them and sterilize and vaccinate them in a year 50000 dogs neutered and 100000 dogs vaccinated in a year that cost 9 crore for the whole year as against feeding which costs 12 crore for the for one month so uh, please take a look at the spreadsheet later about poop i totally agree however how many people pick up their pet dogs poop so if you they take these dogs as pet dogs and they let them loose in the streets again or if they walk them and don't clean up the poop then the risk of pathogens is the same we're back to square one and the other thing is we talk about uh, you know keep them in your home don't uh, you know don't feed the street dogs the truth is in bangalore especially we see people are so hostile they don't even give out their home on rent to people who want who have pets if you say you have a pet even a cat whatever they just refuse people refuse to give them and uh, yes i think uh, i don't remember who i think both these teams mentioned it cluster feeding is a pain it's horrible it must be broken up the responsible feeding is very very important and uh, i think if every street took the responsibility of feeding one or two dogs there would be peace everywhere the problem is But only a few people agree to feed, and then that person ends up feeding twenty dogs together, and then it creates a ruckus all over the place. It makes a mess. Get people, the dogs get into fights. Dogs start attacking people who pass by, and everything. And I think finally, villages, and this is something we have been fighting for with the government. Villages and rural uh, and rural areas, outskirts, really have to ramp up population control and vaccination. Oh, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so i'll uh, i'll come back to the the question of responsibility okay. um here's here's my suggestion then let's solve this problem um how about this if everybody's you somebody said community dogs great idea okay so let's do this um let's have people who feed dogs identify them 
get them microchipped, okay? So that if you are feeding the dog, your name is now associated with that dog on the street because responsibility also comes with liability. And nobody's willing to take liability for when something wrong happens either to the dog. Now dogs on the streets, we've seen hundreds of cases of you know, injuries, road accidents, sick dogs. There's a dog here uh, on ISC campus that's really badly uh, scabbed. I mean, this got really bad mange. It's a simple injection will fix that. But there are lots of dog feeders on, on campus and they fight for the rights to feed, but they won't get that dog treated. That is animal cruelty. Nobody wants to do that, okay? And, um, and if the dog attacks somebody or chases somebody or bites somebody, the, it's the exchequer. So the, uh, the, the Karnataka High Court recently passed a judgment which awarded, I think, 10 lakh rupees for the death of a two-year-old who was mauled to death by dogs. That does not come from the pockets of feeders. That comes from the exchequer. Okay. So this is, so the, you know, the, the liability is being distributed to all of us. So if feeders are willing to do that, then great, go ahead. I'm telling you, we'll solve this problem. Okay, people will not complain. People will know, hey, you know, if my, if my car has been damaged by dogs and, and we've got lots of scooters, being, you know, people being chased, etc. They'll know who to approach. Right now, there's no red redressal mechanism. Also come to the point that you made about uh, uh, feeding not increasing dog numbers. So we did a study, and I'll uh, encourage you to look it up, Bhalla et al. Um, 2020, uh, published in Ambio, where she did, a so student of, of, of mine, uh, she did a survey across, you know, across several parts of Bangalore and found that dog density was not necessarily related to garbage density but were inst instead related to roadside eateries, so cafes and, and, and bakeries, and areas where people were feeding dogs. So that's what dog densities were related to. And she found that a very few number of households were responsible for the highest dog densities in those areas. Okay. So it's, that's a very clear correlation right there, that feeding does, it's not necessarily garbage. So feeding does, I how much? Done, okay. Uh, so I won't go into, into too much. Yeah, just bring some. This one's going to be uh, a little difficult to conclude. We have. <laughs> okay, so we began today's discussion with, you know, is it, com is it compassionate to feed animals? Um, is it the right thing to do or not? I mean, should it just be looked at, you know, with, with the compassion angle? And then, you know, we saw a lot of um, other inputs coming in, you know, and, and it was not just compassion. It's like a tale of two cultures, you know, there's compassion and caritas or charity on one side, and then there's problem solving on the other side. And I, and I think the, the discussion really uh, went from one to the other. And uh, we began today's discussion with, uh, you know, uh, actually the Article 51 AG specifically is quoted a lot by people who are feeding animals, domestic or wild, you know, as, as their right to do it and as their fundamental duty. And, uh, and, and while, you know, we uphold that, has anyone, you know, looked at the Article 51 A? Uh, I think it's H, which speaks for scientific temper, humanism, both in one line, and the spirit of inquiry and reform. And I think this is something that we also need to, you know, think about as well. And I think when it comes to other animals or wildlife, I think most of us meet at, you know, a common place when it comes to, okay, you know, let's not make them dependent on us or let's not intentionally try to do that, you know, as you know, you would normally tell a tourist to, you know, not feed animals or throw food while, you know, they're on a bus going from one location to the other. It's the responsible thing to do. Don't encourage it, right? So that, I mean, for whereas that is concerned, I mean, when it comes to pigeons, when people talk about um, the disease risk, things like that, or it's, it's very common for everyone to come on the same page very quickly. But when it comes to dogs, right, this becomes, this always is such a burning topic. Now, the one thing to know is that a street dog, 
is homeless on the streets out of fate not out of choice right it's there um in the numbers that they are and there are a lot of reasons that have contributed to that the scale of the problem that we are dealing with today we're talking bangalore 3 lakh plus dogs pune the last uh, where i come from the last population estimation we did in 2018 was 3 lakhs plus again um we are seeing i mean with the uh, with the population increasing you are going to see um you know more incidences of you know chasing barking attacks commonly reported in papers i mean the lineage from the gray wolf dated back 23000 years ago you know it's it's when dogs also get in numbers they get their strength in numbers and you will see a lot of these um sort of negative behaviors as perceived by humans you know whether it's chasing acts of it's a it's a normal behavior for them but you see that more when the numbers are more and then everyone wonders how do these numbers become more we need somebody to blame right we blame the government we blame the people who are looking after them or trying to look after them the feeders you know they're commonly called feeders how dogs are these are all just names given to everyone indies for the dogs where the irrespective of what their origin really is or feeders some of them and i often say this in i've been working with animals for the last 15 years and i always say there is the responsible and the irresponsible and the fact of the matter is that there are ones who also feed thousands in a day who the dogs potentially may not ever come to them so they never end up catching them for animal birth control or vaccination in fact feeding them may potentially increase their fecundity so where the puppies wouldn't survive even if they had litters are now surviving because they're being fed but they're not being able to be caught for sterilization anyway the should the it actually boils down to this homelessness you know i mean it's not just dogs the humans as well there are people working on different solutions in an ideal world there should be no homeless dogs right because besides food and hunger they are subjected to there's there's so much threat of survival whether it's accidents harsh weather conditions um uh, you know persecution cruelty met out to them from um you know and and while the solutions uh, for street animals are dismal to none in most parts of our country what do we as citizens do well we do what we can right and sometimes the actions are you know they seem seemingly correct when you're doing them at that moment and i i think we're all sitting here to just uh, discuss that you know maybe there are uh, larger impacts of the action but i think it boils down to um, people do what they can right and while feeding a dog may relieve it of its hunger that's only one part of its misery solved and um i think a very very common scene is today we're all very civilized here but if you if it's very common to hear of a resident welfare association and people who are caring for animals get into extremely uh, hostile uh, arguments and fights and threats most of the times it's not an animal cruelty case it's a human to human cruelty case <laughs> um and so the, as the battle ensues between these extremes i will be done in one minute <laughs> okay as the battle ensues between these two extremes um whether it's the feeders or the ones who don't want them or want to kill them i believe that there is a middle path one where individuals who love animals are not just focused on feeding but on actively reducing the street dogs in their street but also vehemently condemning the segment of feeders who do not do so ir- who responsibly and i think it is the people who are doing it responsibly should be taking more of a stand because the ones who are doing it irresponsibly are negating what they are doing and i think um that's really important and i think that um if every community had to identify the number of dogs on their streets if there were five humanely willing to provide care to them be guided by you know science humanism as also is our fundamental duty solving our street dog concerns does not 
involve ensuring dogs always live on our streets reducing the problems for humans and dogs definitely requires multi stakeholder participation which includes the community government animal welfare organizations and one cannot potentially solve a human dog conflict especially the size and the scale of problems that we have right now with the stakeholders being in conflict thank you